Okay. So welcome everybody to the event, launch event of the Asia Pacific uh, Journal of Evaluation. This event is um, organized and called uh, led by the Asia Pacific Evaluation Association under the Eval for Action campaign with the support of the Asia Pacific Communications Hub. So before we officially start, I would just like to remind our audience to please keep your microphone muted at all times and your video disabled uh, to make to help with the internet bandwidth and to ensure quality event for everyone. You may also please uh, rename your Zoom name so we can also identify you. And if you have any questions and concerns, just feel free to leave them in the chat and we will be happy to address them uh, later on if we do have the time. So yeah. Um, I am Ana Erika Lareza, and I am a board member of the Asia Pacific Evaluation Association and a co-leader of the Eval Youth Asia. And I'm happy to join you all today as the moderator of this event. Um, to welcome everyone, I would like to invite the president of the Asia Pacific Evaluation Association to give his welcoming address, Asela Kologumpitiya. Over to you, Asela. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, everyone. Uh, the Chief Guest, Dr. Michael Quinn Patton, uh, Guest of Honor, Director General Manny from uh, ADB Evaluation Office, Advisory Committee members, Editorial Committee members, APIA Board members, colleagues, and friends. I warmly welcome all <coughs> of you on behalf of the Asia Pacific Evaluation Association to this historical moment of launch in the uh, first Asia Pacific Evaluation Journal. This marks a significant step in the evaluation field in the region. Thank you all for joining and witnessing this. The launch of the evaluation journal is a result of continuous push by several thought leaders. Efforts by many intellectuals and climax of excellent progress made in the region by volunteer leaders. Asia Pacific Evaluation Association has initiated a comprehensive evaluation volunteer uh, with uh, evaluation, uh, 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 comprehensive evaluation capacity development program in the region uh, under the regional evaluation strategy led by fantastic leaders. The progress made by each team is remarkable and the amount of work done with volunteer contribution is amazing. We address policies to professionalization, to capacity building, to parliamentarians, to workers, to communities. To make evaluation a recognized profession, we need to address all aspects. Ours is a classic example of how a team of like-minded professionals can make a difference in a whole region. We believe in teamwork. We believe in volunteer contribution, irrespective of size of the contribution. We believe in shared leadership. We believe in creating opportunities, particularly for newcomers, young and emerging evaluators. We have a bunch of young professionals leading several initiatives. The journal will help for knowledge generation and sharing. We want to make it a quality and popular journal as many other evaluation journals, as you know. Therefore, we invite all of you to be part of it and also write articles. Of course, the deadline is 31st uh, uh, next month and we invite you. For the journal, we have excellent members for the editorial board and the advisory board. All our well-recognized professionals in the field of evaluation have vast experience. Our advisory committee members are coming from one end to the other uh, end of the globe. Uh, the excellent ideas and contribution from both committees is really appreciated. I must also mention Dr. Sham Singh, who took the overall leadership uh, to cheer the task. His vision, leadership, and commitment helped to make uh, the journal a reality. I also want to thank Apia board, including Anirudh, for the support, and also our team, uh, Randika, Madhuka, for lifting the heavy work. And also we thank Erika for moderating this event and all helping uh, all our work. This is just a start. We hope to get back to you in December with the first issue of the journal. Once again, I welcome all of you and thank you for joining this historical event. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Asala, for that wonderful welcoming remarks. 
So to talk more about the Asia Pacific Journal of Evaluation, I would like to invite Professor Aki Yonehara, Associate Editor of the of the journal and also an editor of the Japanese Journal of Evaluation Studies. Professor Aki, the floor is yours. Thank you, Erika, for the kind introduction. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce this journal today to you all here. Uh, on behalf of the editorial committee, I would like to explain why we need this journal and what shall we expect uh, this, to this journal. Uh, before reaching this decision of the journal launch, we, the editorial committee member, had an uh, intensive discussion about the purpose of this journal. Uh, because there are already several journals existing in the field of evaluation studies, uh, why we still need a new journal? Uh, what do we want uh, this new journal to be like among other useful and quality journals? As we observed recently, the globalization of the world value and localization and diversification of the life level values have proceeded at the same time. On one hand, uh, the global uh, goals such as SDGs have more influence on our government and it provides somehow unified world value or direction of the future world. And on the other hand, our local life becomes more diverse and we are required to pay more serious attention to the different values in our daily life, like in terms of race, gender, ethnicity, religion, culture, politics, and more. So how should we localize that unified global value into our local policies or specific project under such a dynamic and uncertain world today? How can we operationalize that these values uh, in a peaceful and uh, more democratic manner? And who can consistently adjust and connect these values in a, uh, the more democratic way? I would answer that evaluators and evaluation system can do it. Uh, developmental evaluation may help us adjust uncertain dynamic changes to support innovation for the social betterment. And program evaluation may help us translate the global value into the local practices. Or impact evaluation may help us visualize the values for stronger accountability. So it is a great advantage for us evaluators and evaluation researchers to have such a variety of methods and the channels towards a better society through evaluation. So now let me turn to the original questions. Uh, why we still need this new journal? And what do we want this new journal to be like? Uh, among other you know, useful journals. Uh, Asia Pacific region is one of the most diversity rich earlier in the world. Uh, um, that, that is why uh, we could say this uh, region might need a healthy and democratic evaluation system more than any other region in the world. And the studies and the practices from this region can make a great contribution uh, to bringing the diversity uh, to the field of evaluation at the global level. So our Asia Pacific Journal of Evaluation aims to nurture innovation, localization, and creation of values in such diverse societies through evaluation studies and practices. This journal also aims to become a platform for various evaluators, both academic and practical, uh, to promote innovative policy and on-field practices. And this new journal pays a special attention to an aspect of evaluation capacity building as well, uh, because there is an emergent need to grow the quality evaluators and next generation researchers in this field. So reflecting on these purposes, this journal opens four categories. The first one is a research articles. 
uh, which is expected to present rigorous research studies and new perspectives to contribute to development of evaluation studies at the global level. And second category is a practice notes, uh, which is describes the experiences of evaluation practices uh, in the local uh, context with a special focus on uh, capturing the innovations. And the third category is a policy corner. Uh, this is a space uh, dedicated to the discussion on the policy issues. And it's, uh, this piece can be written uh, in collaboration with policymakers. And the last one is evaluation capacity building, uh, which aims to strengthen the education and training on evaluation. So call for paper information has already been out on our website. Uh, we are greatly welcome your contribution. Actually, I'm very much excited to work with you all here today. So let's uh, construct such platform from Asia Pacific region together. So thank, thank you. you very much uh, for your cooperation uh, in advance. Thank you, Professor Aki, for introducing the, uh, the Asia Pacific Journal of Evaluation as well. So as Professor Aki have said, it is now time for us to launch uh, the Journal of Evaluation for Asia Pacific. So I would like to invite our honored guests to please uh, kindly turn on your videos uh, so that as we welcome the, um, the journal. So please turn on your videos. So yeah, what we, so now what you have in front of you today is the official face of the Asia Pacific Journal of Evaluation. This journal, as Professor Aki have said, would serve as a power platform uh, to promote the evaluation theory, methodology, uh, and practices in our region. In doing so, we are also able to highlight not only the challenges that we face, but also the achievements um, uh, that we achieve uh, in monitoring and evaluation profession, and this will serve as, as our strong foundation for the evaluation profession in the Asia Pacific. And with that, um, please congratulate uh, ourselves as well uh, as we officially launch the Asia Pacific Journal of Evaluation. So congratulations to the Asia Pacific Evaluation Association as well for uh, leading this initiative. Congratulations, everyone, and we look forward for everyone's contributions as well. So. To further commemorate um, our lunch, I would, it is my honor to you to invite uh, doc, Dr. Michael Kinpaton, former president of the American Evaluation Association and editorial board member of multiple uh, evaluation journals such as uh, American Journal of Evaluation, Evaluation and Program Planning, Journal of Multidisciplinary Evaluation, and former editor of Journal of Ex Extension. So, Dr. Patton, please take the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm delighted to and honored to be a part of this important launch of the Asia Pacific Evaluation Journal. And I look forward to the journal as it unfolds and, and learning from it. Um, and I congratulate all those involved. It's such an enormous uh, enterprise to pull this together, to make it happen. A lot of people, a lot of work, and to get a sense of the enormity of what this represents, I think it's worthwhile reviewing the enormity of Asia itself. Four and a half million square hect uh, kilometers, 30% of the Earth's total land, uh, nearly 9% of the Earth's surface, 48 countries, diversity, 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 as we heard from Aki. Uh, Asia has uh, nearly uh, more than 60% of the, the world's population, uh, economic dynamism, and the future. Well, we know now that that future includes the Asia Pacific Evaluation Journal. I'm going to share some thoughts uh, stimulated by the launch of the, the journal about global trends uh, and challenges that we face together. Um, uh, beginning with the importance 
of what is being called the Asian century, the projected dominance of Asian economies, politics, and culture in the 21st century, a theme to which I'll return. But first, let's take a look back in time. I get fascinated um, by language. I was part of a uh, contributing to the journal uh, edition that Rodney Hobson uh, edited on how and why language matters. And Salman Rushdie has said, names, once they are in common use, quickly become mere sounds. Their entomology being buried like so many of the earth's marvels beneath the dust of habit, spoken as an author who cares a great deal about words. So I became curious about the origin of Asia. The word comes from a Greek word, was initially used to refer to the eastern bank of the Aegean Sea, but was later used to refer to the region of Anatolia, modern Turkey, rather than the entire continental mass. And given the Greek origins, it turns out that uh, Asia in Greek mythology was the name of the wife of Prometheus. Prometheus was the titan god of fire. His name means forethought. He is credited with molding humankind as in Greek mythology out of mud and clay and dedicated himself to spreading knowledge to humans, which his wife Asia supported him with and helped with. But the gods, Zeus in particular, was uh, unhappy and quite angry that Prometheus stole fire from the gods to give to humans. And so the Promethean challenge is who will benefit from and control new technologies, big data, remote sensing, artificial intelligence, blockchain, satellite scanning, and what's being called metaverse technologies, the next generation of the internet and worldwide web. How these new technologies serve humankind or in fact uh, create more dominance of the powerful is one of the challenges uh, going forward. Prometheus was punished by Zeus, tied to a mountain where his liver was pecked by an eagle every day, but Asia nurtured him. And in that context, uh, it reminds us that as Prometheus found that the powerful don't like having truth spoken to them or being challenged. Uh, indeed, we find ourselves shouting truth to power. Uh, and the basis for our communications in the rigor and scholarship of our field is what this journal will help as we communicate to policymakers, to each other. But we do so at a time when there's a great uh, division between political views scientific views. Um, we live in what's being called the misinformation age, the post-truth age, in an infodemic of, of misinformation and of, of distorted information. And so we are at this period globally where facts, evidence, truth, data, reality, thinking is up against post-truth, fake news, alternative facts, make-believe, groupthink, distortions. And evaluation is front and center in this. How will the Asia Pacific Evaluation Journal engage in and contribute to this battle of ideas and evidence? For the stakes involve the, the future of our ability to think with evidence, to act with evidence, uh, and to work towards creating uh, a better world. So the Asia part, let's think about the Pacific part of this. The Pacific Ocean is a uh, hundred and 65 square kilometers, the largest and deepest of the Earth's ocean. It covers about 46% of the Earth's water surface. It is larger than Earth's entire land areas combined, home to more than 25,000 islands, large and small. And the name Pacific was given by Portuguese explorer Fernand, Ferdinand Magellan in 1521 as he encountered favorable winds on reaching the ocean. He called it the Mar Pacifico, which in Portuguese and Spanish means peaceful sea. He had just come through what is now known as the Straits of Magellan and very turbulent seas and was delighted with his crew to come up on this Pacific uh, area. Uh, but it also reminds us then that the language 
of Asia and Pacific with roots in Greece, with roots in colonialism uh, as a Pacific makes one of the issues that we all face as a, as a profession decolonizing evaluation. Much of our language, language uh, of accountability, uh, military language of strategy and targeting, uh, language of, of independence and views about what counts as evidence. There's a great deal of work going on in the profession that the Asia Pacific Evaluation Journal can contribute to around decolonizing and indigenizing uh, evaluation. So let's return now from Greece, ancient Greece to the notion of the 21st century as the Asian century. Um, this is a headline from the Global Forum that said we've entered the Asian century and there is no turning back. Uh, there are a number of books about the future is Asian, uh, realizing the Asian century. The data show that you know, currently, Asia constitutes about 32% of the world's gross domestic product, and the projections are by 2050, it will constitute more than half of the world's gross domestic product. That's part of the economics of the Asian century. And there are conferences and forums going on. This is one uh, on women leaders and the new Asian century, uh, leading responsibly in the Asian century was being called Easternization, war and peace in the Asian century. Um, but there are the naysayers, the end of the Asian century already being pronounced um, and the concern about collapse of major cities across Asia and indeed the world. And so as always, there is good news and bad news. There's pessimism and optimism. And part of what we do as evaluators is try to sort out the good news and the bad news balance of pessimism and the optim optimism uh, as we move forward. So in addition to this being the Asian century, we are now entered the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene um, is a recognition that we are the first generation to know that we are destroying the planet and the last generation that can do anything about it. Uh, speaking truth about the global crisis, part of the challenge is whether evaluation will be part of the problem or part of the solution. And the journal can be a contribution to making it part of the solution. The anthrop Anthropocene is a geological time unit. Geologic time is broken into units of time going back to the four and a half billion years <clears throat> of the earth. Um, and in those different stages that the Earth itself as a dynamic planet with tectonic plates and the molten core bringing about changes on the surface. But the Anthropocene is the movement for the first time where human beings uh, are having more impact upon the Earth's processes than are those natural processes. And so evaluation in the Anthropocene means that human actions have created the global problems humanity faces. Human actions are necessary to resolve these problems. Thus, there are things for evaluators to know <clears throat> and act on about global sustainability in the context of the Anthropocene, to undertake evaluations knowledgeably and credibly. Um, the Anthropocene then calls our attention to the challenges of humans and nature thriving together there are good things happening, efforts with new technology, with solar uh, power, with wind power, with uh, ocean power, geothermal power, with new ways of reducing our fossil fuel dependence. But at the same time, all the indicators on global heating are going in the wrong direction. Ecology and Society Journal called the concept of the Anthropocene a game changer a new context for social innovation and transformation to society. And so we have this struggle of the human footprint on the earth in the Anthropocene. We are clearly in a climate emergency. Uh, journalist Tim Harford said, all we need now is a way to focus attention on a problem, climate change, that is too slow to be called a crisis and too dangerous to be called anything else. This cartoon from The Economist magazine 
shows the world fighting the coronavirus uh, as a preliminary round with climate change standing on the outside in the major bout, our major battle for humanity. The Stockholm Resilience Center has been tracking these various trends of carbon dioxide, surface temperatures, uh, loss of tropical forest habitat, domesticated land, and we have what is being called the great acceleration from the 1950s into this 21st century. Population increases, energy increases. All the indicators are going in the wrong direction for human and biodiversity. The sixth extinction, uh, a loss of biodiversity suggests that, that we are in a time when we're losing species in large numbers and the future of humanity itself is in doubt. Um, as a part of this challenge, it's only fair that I acknowledge that part of the decline of the United States in the Asian century is not only the polarization, the increase of, of polarization around ethnicity, but that Asian uh, hate crimes have been increasing in the United States. Part of a recognition that the good things that happen come with shadow sides and that we live in challenging times. UNICEF put out a report on the impact of climate change on children, uh, which showed the distribution of the world's 2.3 billion children. And you see where the yellow dots are, the concentration of children, the future of the, the world in Asia. Um, they have in their publication scenarios of what it's going to be like one point five billion children nearly are affected um, and living in areas of severe damage from climate change uh, if we continue the way that trends are currently going. Uh, and so we have the global pandemic, the infodemic of bad information, food systems with major hunger on the increase because of the pandemic, uh, and the war in U Ukraine, the economic turbulence, the climate emergency, major increases in, in equity and uh, social justice worldwide. These complex system interactions are the context within which the journal will make its contributions. Um, and so the world is in trouble. Uh, humanity at least is in trouble. The earth will be fine. The planet will be fine. And so what we have coming together here at this moment is the positive forecast of the Asia century and the threatening forecast of the Anthropocene and where the journal, the Asia Pacific Evaluation Association will make its contribution is in the nexus as the ascendancy of Asia uh, runs up against the challenges to all of humanity. Global problems transcend national and agency boundaries. Things like climate change, economic turbulence, refugees at record levels, virulent infectious diseases, dying oceans, global cyber terrorism, international drug cartels, human trafficking, weapons trafficking, increased poverty and inequality, multinational corporate collusion, world hunger. These problems, uh, the definitions are disputed, the facts are a matter of debate, politics and special interests dominate, and the stakes are huge. And what we'll be looking at as evaluators is how we contribute both to understanding the nature of these problems and looking at proposed solutions. As Einstein famously said, we cannot solve our problems with the same level of thinking that created them. And so this calls on evaluation to step up. People and planet prospering together requires management of natural resources sustainably biodiversity and ecosystem resilience, fresh water and sustainable fishing, fertile soil and regenerative soil practices, resilient forest habitats and ecosystems, all requiring reduced reliance on fossil fuels and reducing carbon in the atmosphere. Given well-documented trends, human degradation of land, air, and sea are threatening food systems, water systems, animal systems, and ecosystems. Changing temperatures are distressing systems that humans depend on for energy, food, pollination, medicine, minerals, timber, all increasingly overwhelmed by unsustainable and ungenerative patterns of production and consumption. The growing middle class globally 
will come face to face with strained planetary boundaries. And so the agenda has moved from simply carrying out projects for effectiveness to transformation of systems. Solutions will require breaking down the silos of sectors, forestry, agriculture, energy, transport, health, and working with a variety of stakeholders across landscapes, seascapes, and cities to achieve multiple goals at once. There simply isn't enough time or money to pursue isolated and contradictory solutions. And that puts evaluation up front and center on dealing with transformation. The world is getting smaller, more constrained and interconnected. We have an opportunity to apply system-wide systemic thinking and leverage data to solve the challenges of our time. Transformation. This is the era that we've moved into and evaluation is already rising to the occasion. Uh, the conference theme, of the American Evaluation Association 2014 was visionary evaluation for a sustainable, equitable future. The Australasian Evaluation Society had a conference dedicated to transformation. The European Evaluation Society in that same year looked at evaluation for more resilient societies. The Ideas Conference in Prague in 2019 was devoted to evaluation for transformative change. Evaluating transformation has arrived on the agenda of the global evaluation profession. The new Academy for Evaluation Internationally has made transformation the centerpiece of its work. The, uh, earlier this month, the European Evaluation Society met in Copenhagen with the theme evaluation at a watershed. A watershed, actions and shifting paradigms for challenging times. At the last ideas conference in Prague, the conference ended with a Prague declaration of 10 items that you can find on the website. But item six called for sustainability to become a universal criterion in evaluations. In all our evaluations, we commit to social, environmental, and economic sustainability and transformation including by assessing contextual factors and systemic changes. We commit to assessing and highlighting in all evaluations unintended negative social, economic, and environmental effects. That kind of level of transformation calls on the journal to make contributions to sustainability one of the kinds of contributions that we look for. This means thinking beyond autonomous projects and programs, to major systems change. And that means moving from theories of change to theories of transformation. Evaluating transformation then will require transforming evaluation. The great management consultant, Peter Drucker said, the greatest danger in times of turbulence is not the turbulence, it is to act with yesterday's logic. So we are being challenged as evaluators to think beyond narrow projects, which we grew out of evaluation emerged as a way of evaluating projects and programs now to doing systems change and major transformation uh, ways. This creates challenges for our methods. It creates challenges for uh, our relationships with stakeholders, with the complexity and the dynamism of the work that we have to be involved in. Traditionally, evaluation over the last 50 years has gotten very good at evaluating projects and programs, logic models, theories of change, smart goals, implementation evaluation, measuring outcomes and impacts, generating findings, judgments, lessons, recommendations. But now we're being asked to evaluate mission, strategy, advocacy, policy changes, systems change, complex dynamic interventions, community impacts, regional initiatives, environmental ecosystem sustainability, networks and collaborations, leadership, inclusiveness and diversity, innovation, scaling, and transformation. <clears throat> None of these things are projects. None of them are simple programs. They involve massive transformational initiatives, and that's going to change and challenge what we do. Tom Schwant has talked and written about post-normal evaluation. Some folks have thought we're going to return to the way things were post-pandemic. A post-normal evaluation is a message that there is no returning back. The 2021 Asian Evaluation Week focused on transformational evaluation, moving from uncertainties to resilience, 
with a focus on the new normal, having to look at the world in different ways, that shifting paradigm, um, bringing knowledge to bear on how that work goes forward. And so the work I've been doing on Blue Marble Evaluation includes a principles of looking at the entire globe and the ways in which these interconnected threats to the future of humanity uh, challenge us. But it means thinking globally, acting contextually and globally, evaluating the interactions. Contextually is where the region, Asia, the Asian century all comes into play. The word that's emerged for this is global. Global is the combination of the words global and local, mitigated and managed through regional actions. Um, and so what we are going to be balancing and what the journal will balance is global knowledge in connection with local and regional Asia specific knowledge and evaluation. Zooming out for the big picture, zooming in within Asia and zooming in within the sub ecosystems of Asia. At the same time, with the inequality in the world, the equitable evaluation initiative calls on us to make all evaluations address equity. And so one of the examples of inequity is the inequitable distribution of vaccines. The blue is where there's a surplus of vaccines and the, the pink and orange is where there's a deficit. We see that, that Asia has a deficit of vaccines in comparison to the West. And so the challenge of looking long-term, medium-term, short-term, having a lens on how we deal with the Anthropocene with the new Asian century and do so in evaluation toward a more equitable and sustainable future. The role of the Asian Pacific Evaluation Association and the journal in promoting sustainability and equity is a central challenge of our future. And as Mahatma Gandhi said, the future depends on what you do, what we do today. So the call is for all hands on deck, that the world is in fact an emergency and that all of what we do as evaluators needs to be contributing to transformation towards sustainability and equity and to do so quickly. The speed with which things are changing is increased, but the union of scientists have moved the doomsday clock where humanity uh, is on the brink to 80 seconds before midnight. Acting with a sense of urgency then in this post-normal world it leads us to have to face these challenges with a sense of urgency. 2030 looms large in the reporting of the sustainable development goals. And we're off track on all of those indicators. So part of the transformation challenge is thinking across silos of the SDGs and looking at how in fact they are interconnected and interdependent, bringing global systems analysis skills to those interconnected SDGs. This is a map of India of different organizations, non-governmental organizations uh, working together on largely different kinds of security issues, personal security, economic security, community security, environmental security, education security, food security, political security, health security. It's looking at the interconnections of these issues where we're going to find the nexus of transformation and matching the evaluation design to the evaluation's purpose, resources, and timelines to optimize use. And so as we look to the future, It's worth noting the work that's been going on in Africa around made in Africa evaluation. Soli Gariba, who we unfortunately have lost, uh, was a pioneer in thinking about made in Africa evaluation. And that's become a recurring theme of the African Evaluation Association. What will evaluation made in Asia look like? What will that be? And how will that contribute to our broader understanding? So, let me close with a review of the 10 points that I've made. <clears throat> we are facing the competition and conflict between the positive 
uh, image of the Asia century and the threat to humankind of the Anthropocene. We have questions about who will benefit from and control new technologies and whether they'll be used only in service of the elite or in service of all of humanity. Prometheus punished by the gods for helping humanity reminds us that we're gonna to have to be dealing with power, uh, speaking and shouting truth to power. This is going to put us in an advocacy position, decolonizing evaluation, uh, finding out how we make sustainability a universal criterion in evaluation and making equity a universal criterion, connecting the local and the global together, um, dealing with a sense of urgency given time is running out, evaluating across silos to transform systems and creating a special contribution from Asia of made in Asia evaluation. These are the things that came up for me as I thought about and looked at the journal. I often my congratulations and appreciation for all of those who've done work. Um, we're forward into the Asian century. This contribution is going to be hugely important. And so let me close by congratulating the launch and the birth of this new journal. Congratulations to all who have been involved. And we celebrate the new Asia Pacific Evaluation Journal. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sir, Sir MQP, for your warm welcome and for sharing with us such profound insights on what, what uh, the the, the future challenges and opportunities that we will be facing for the evaluation profession. And of course, like for sharing your insights as well on how the journal, the Asia Pacific Journal of Evaluation can play a role for this. And I am with you, sir, in agreeing that we are all looking forward to what evaluation looks like that is made in uh, Asia. So thank you, sir, MQP. Um, up next, we also have another honored guest, uh, I am proud to welcome Sir, um, Sir uh, Emmanuel Jimenez, the Director General of the ADB Independent Evaluation Department. Uh, he is here with us to give a speech as our guest of honor. And I would also like to add that he is also the editor of the Journal of Development of Effectiveness under 3IE. So Sir Mani, over to you. Thank you uh, very much, Erica. Uh, and thank you, uh, Apeya, for inviting me. It's an honor to be a uh, speaker in this launch of the uh, Apeya Journal. Uh, and I welcome this launch. Uh, Professor Patton is a very hard act to follow. Uh, he gave a, a thought-provoking, but also very inspiring speech. And I was very happy to have heard it. So I was thinking, what kind of value might I add and I thought that I would just offer you some reflections, um, free reflections actually, on um, given my role as uh, an editor of another uh, evaluation journal and uh, also a former editor of the World Bank Research Observer. So I've been editing for about a dozen years. So just three lessons. Uh, one lesson going forward is developing a market niche. Uh, the Apeya Journal is a startup. As with any startup, it's really important to define uh, what the value added that journal will bring to a market. Now that's a market that already has several evaluation journals. I asked the ADB library uh, to conduct a search of how many there were, and they came up with at least 15 evaluation journals around the world, and two were focused on the region, Australasia and South Asia. And the Apeya Journal has to attract, of course, readers. Uh, it's in competition and subscribers, but more, almost more importantly, it has to attract authors who will be willing to submit good papers. Uh, and so how is the Apeya Journal going to break into this market? So one way forward is to identify a market niche, which is a specialized segment of the market of a particular kind of service. Uh, and uh, I'm an economist, so I think in these terms. Um, my, the journal that I edit has a niche, the Journal of Development Effectiveness. 
uh, focuses on uh, impact evaluations uh, that address the issue of causality. It's a limited market, uh, but it's also one that uh, has a very loyal fo uh, following. I was thinking, what would be the market niche for a Bayer journal? Uh, I think that as Professor Patton mentioned, it really would be important uh, to uh, focus on special issues that are going to be of great interest to the region. Uh, he mapped out a set of ideas and I just wanted to reiterate at least three of them that resonated with me. Uh, one is that this is a region that uh, is characterized by a lot of risk and uncertainty, perhaps more so in the future even, uh, between climate change, uh, uh, disasters, and uh, health pandemics. It's also a region, perhaps, a second... <laughs> ...that I thought might be important, uh, is this is a region uh, that is going through a demographic transition uh, in which the issue of aging is going to uh, actually be in the forefront in the future. And a third issue uh, that Professor Patton pointed out also is inequality. It's a fast growing region, but the region is going to be more focused on those left behind. So uh, of course, as a journal, you'll be going to be attracting uh, uh, authors to submit. You can't force them to submit to these uh, issues. But I thought that perhaps what you might wanna consider is to develop special issues on topics like these, like risk and uncertainty, demographic change and inequality, just to make sure that uh, you have an audience that will uh, be attracted uh, to the kinds of issues that are closest to them. Uh, so that's one issue, one niche. Another niche that I think you already have in a very interesting one is that aside from academic pieces, I noticed that uh, you're gonna be developing uh, practice notes, uh, a policy corner and capacity building. And that's really very intriguing uh, that uh, you're gonna uh, have not only academic pieces, but ones that are focused on policy. I think the challenge here is going to be how you're going to curate this uh, uh, in the future to make sure that the policy pieces are of the same uh, uh, standard in terms of rigor as academic pieces. So that's the first niche is, the first lesson is developing a market niche. A second lesson, uh, just from my experience, is that it's really important to have a good listserv of peer reviewers. Because in a set, uh, your uh, production will be dependent upon your supply of authors. And supply of authors will want to be reviewed uh, with quality, but also in a timely way. And in my experience, getting peer reviewers is often the most difficult part of this process uh, because uh, they're doing it for free and uh, they have their own timeline. So, uh, and they're also, uh, uh, you're, you're beholden to the goodness of their, uh, of their hearts. So the question is how to develop that. I would encourage everyone in this uh, uh, presentation and this call to be offer their services to all of you, to the journal uh, as a peer reviewer uh, and to do so in a timely way. So uh, the, uh, the last uh, uh, lesson is make sure that the articles are provided free and open access. Uh, that will make sure that you have a good readership and keep demand high. And that's also good for authors because what the authors are most concerned about is having a broad readership. Uh, the challenge, of course, when you have open access is what is a good business model because journals uh, make their money uh, and keep the journal alive through subscriptions. And uh, uh, one of the challenges that we've had in our journal is how to uh, make sure that we have donors who can um, ensure, especially in our, uh, for uh, readers in poorer countries, that they're able to access 
the articles for free. So those are just uh, three uh, uh, reflections from my part as you start this journal is uh, think about uh, developing the market niche for the journal. Uh, secondly, ensuring that you develop that uh, list of good peer reviewers uh, who will do so in a high quality and a timely way. And the third is how to make sure you uh, have uh, your articles be accessible to as many readers as possible, especially those from developing countries. But I think that you're off to a great start, uh, judge, ju just judging from uh, what I've read uh, in the descriptions. And um, I also want to congratulate you in this launch. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Sir Manny, for sharing us with us like, and pointing out critical issues that indeed that the journal will have to face. And of course, for sharing your lessons and experiences as well for us to be able, for the journal to be able to move forward successfully. So yeah, uh, before we officially move forward with our agenda, I would like to ask all of our speakers and our audience as well, if you could please turn on your videos and let's have a group picture with all of, uh, with everyone. So. Please turn on your videos. Make sure you all have good lighting. <laughs> all right. Okay. Let's give it. Get, let's give it a minute for to give an opportunity for everyone to turn on their videos. Okay. Okay, I think no one else is gonna join. So I will be taking our picture now in three, two, one, smile. Okay, one sec, one more. Another one, one. Okay, someone's, all, someone, sorry, like what? Okay, one, two, three, smile. Got it. Thank you, everyone, for opening your videos, and we will now proceed with our agenda. So, thank you again, Sir Mani, for joining us and sharing your speech, uh, sharing your words of wisdom with us. So, up next to um, to share like the directions of which, like you know, how are we gonna take this uh, journal forward? I am proud to welcome uh, Dr. Sham into the floor, the editor of the Asia Pacific Journal of Evaluation. Dr. Sham, the floor is yours. Thank you, Erika. Um, thank you very much. Yes, we are new, so we need to have a path ahead. And we have a fair idea about the journal's future trajectory uh, from Dr. Aki's introductory remarks and the thorough framework from Dr. Patrick's speech. I would build on uh, these ideas further. With the growing importance of development effectiveness you know, uh, need and the demand for, for, for bringing transparency and accountability in development assistance. The journal has important role play in the strengthening ability movement in Asia Pacific. The journal would like to contribute not only to academic knowledge building exercise with rigor, but also to strengthen policy making and implementation practices and innovation in the field of monitoring and evaluation. The journal would like to promote usability of evaluation, which would need us to focus on enabling the last user to participate in use the learning coming out of an evaluation exercise. This last user could be the lowest level of a government or civil society functionary at the village level. And this way, the journal would like to fill the space that is more often inaccessible for those who are supposed to use that knowledge most. As Dr. Ekki highlighted, the journal aims to showcase contextual complexities and promote local values that are important for any development intervention to get success. We understand that many practices cannot undermine or ignore such factors. Therefore, localizing monitoring and evaluation in Asia Pacific would be an important goal that the journal would like to pursue in, in, in recent future. In terms of operationalization of these strategies and, and the goal that I just have stated, we are planning to develop formal partnerships, and I'm saying formal, with policymakers, multilateral organizations, including United Nations. 
ADB and many others in practitioners in Asia Pacific. Perhaps something that mainstream journals rarely do or they don't do at all. And, and this partnership would be in the form of bringing collaborative spatial issues uh, on the practice and innovations in the field of marketing and evaluation. And this would involve engaging with the practitioners, helping them develop practice and policy notes for the journal, and developing video abstracts and video papers for building capacities. We at the editorial board are very hopeful that with your support and under the able guidance of our esteemed colleagues on, on the journal's advisory board, we will be able to achieve these goals. Thank you very much. Thank you, Erika. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shang. And up next, we have a, con a few congratulatory videos from our partners. So I would like to pass the floor to our production team to share the video. Congratulations to Appia and to those who have been involved, who are currently involved and who will be involved in making sure that the journal is full of substance and useful information that is well researched, well referenced and hopefully well circulated that will reflect the true context of evaluation practice across the Asia Pacific where there are many different interests and contexts which is a very rich learning ground and important aspect of documenting and pushing forward knowledge to improve the evaluation sector. Well done to all. Thank you. It is a great honour for me to congratulate the successful launch of the Asia Pacific Journal on Evaluation, which will certainly enrich the scholarly and practical discussions on results management. Thank you very much. We would like to congratulate APEA on the launching of the Asia Pacific Journal of Evaluation. We wish you good success. Thank you. I'm certain that this journal will bring much needed focus on the evaluation initiatives and successes in the Asia Pacific region. I wish the team the very best as they take this critical step towards building strong thought leadership through the journal. Congratulations. I would like to congratulate APIA for successfully launching its first ever official journal called Asia Pacific Journal of Evaluation. May this journal benefit our targeted audience such as readers in social work network, non-profit organizations, academia, public sector, consulting firms, and donor agencies. Thank you. As a researcher of evaluation, I am jubilant to see the launch of Asia Pacific Evaluation Journal. This provides an opportunity to young and emerging evaluators in the region to publish their research work and case studies in an international level journal, which is contextualized to Asia Pacific. I feel even more proud to note that last year during the regional dialogue on NEPS, I was the one to propose the need to establish a journal to professionalize evaluation in the region and within one year API has made it a reality. This will help to engage academia and researchers and to contribute to evaluation knowledge and practice. I once again congratulate API and the journal team on this initiative and look forward to contributing to the same. Thank you. Thank you very much. So before, again, like, so we are nearing the closing of our event. So before, before we move forward, I would just like to invite, I give acknowledgement and appreciation to our advisory and editorial board members. Many of them have joined with us, with, uh, are with us today in our, particip in our list of participants. So I would like to ask you guys to please, at least turn on your videos or say hi in the chat. So. For our editorial board members, it is my pleasure to introduce them to you. We have Dr. Sham, uh, Professor Aki, Dr. Soma, Dr. Shweta, and Dr. Vivek. As for our advisory board, we also have Professor Ian Goldman, Professor Neinhard Stockman, Professor Keiko Nishino, Professor Sham, Prof Professor Wolfgang, Dr. Christina Magro, Ma'am Tessie, Dr. Zenda, Dr. Fiona, Dr. Candice, and Dr. Joe Puri. So to all of our advisory and editorial board members, thank you for joining us. Thank you for your support. And we look forward to more 
uh, more collaboration with you as we take this journal forward. So thank you everyone for joining us. So to officially uh, close the event, we would I would like to invite Dr. Soma De Silva to give a summary and vote of thanks. Dr. Soma, over to you. Thank you, Erika. It is my great pleasure and honor to extend sincere thanks to all who contributed to the success of this historic event of launching the Asia Pacific Journal of Evaluation. First, some memorable ideas our distinguished speakers presented. Professor Patton reminded us that Asia Pacific region, having the largest share of the global population, can influence a transformative change by understanding and responding to the current and emerging trends. We have the challenge of dealing with competing trends and the opportunity to create a Made in Asia brand. Dr. Manny highlighted the importance of establishing a market niche, uh, developing a network of reviewers and sustaining a business model. Professor Michael Fatton, we are privileged and honored that you delivered the keynote address as the chief guest. Director General Dr. Manny, thank you for being the guest of honor and sharing important ideas on the way forward. Our appreciative thanks to Dr. Sham Singh for outlining the directions of the journal and Professor Aki for explaining the rationale and the expectations of the journal, pointing out that great diversity of the Asia Pacific region could help bring diversity to evaluation globally. Our thanks go to the advisory committee and the editorial board, especially Professor Sham for giving a great start to the journal. An evaluation journal to capture and communicate issues of evaluation in the Asia Pacific region is a long felt need. The Asia Pacific Evaluation Association stepped forward to bridge this gap, another leap in the evaluation field. Thanks are due to all thought leaders, volunteer contributors, and young and emerging evaluators who have nurtured the concept of a journal into a reality. Special thanks are due to the president of APIA, Dr. Sela Kadugampitian, the executive committee, and the members for their foresight. Today's event was planned meticulously by the production team and the moderator, Erika. Thank you, production team. Most importantly, our appreciation is offered to you who participated in this launch. Your presence made this event successful. Your articles will make the Asia Pacific Journal of Evaluation a quality and popular journal like other evaluation journals as Dr. Sela Kadugyam mentioned in his welcome address and create a Made in Asia brand. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Soma. And again, for seconding Dr. Soma, thank you everyone uh, for joining us today. Congratulations to Apeya. And I uh, hope you all have a good day. For more updates, please visit the Asia Pacific Eval.org or you may email apeya.secretariat at gmail.com for questions and concerns. We are also available on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook for if you want to stay tuned into more updates. So with that, I am happy to send uh, everyone off. Thank you so much and have a great day. Goodbye. Thank you for joining us. Congrats. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much.